I, I had done it. I finished the Ursula K. Le Guin Award in Fiction. So I wanted to put all my thoughts in one video. Um, if you didn't know, this is a fiction award that does come with a cash prize. It is voted on and I believe nominated by a jury of authors this year that I really respect. Um, so I'm curious to see which one they make the winner. I don't know, actually, having read this, what the winner may be. I have no idea. I know which ones I liked best and I would love it for me to be one of those. <laughs> but, uh, and I have some that I didn't like. We have a lot of range of ratings here from like two star. Did any of these get five star? I don't know. Some for sure got like a high four and a half. I'm unsure if some of these got five stars, but it was still for me a fun project. And I wanted to put all my thoughts in one video. And I've categorized the books into three groups as we go through them. I have books I would recommend to literary fiction readers. Like they almost feel like, yeah, maybe there's magical realism or weird supernatural metaphors, but these are literary fiction books. They use the trends, the tips, the tricks, the tools that people use when they are working in that craft. And then we have the like literary fantasy section. <laughs> I think they're all fantasy. I'm just looking around, or maybe like sci-fi, but they mostly feel like literary fantasy, which does not work for me nearly as well as literary sci-fi. And I think that kind of shows in my experience with these, but there's literary sci fantasy. And then we have genre where I'm just like, yeah, these are genre fiction. You would find them in the science fiction fantasy section of your bookstore, and they will follow trends and tropes that you are used to in that sphere. And we'll just go from my lowest to highest rated in each group, starting with literary. Um, the first one may be my least favorite of everything I read, unsure. It was also short, so at least, you know, didn't overstay its welcome too much. Although I definitely think this should only have been 100 pages instead of 200. And that's Orbitals. This one was also for sure the most disappointing because I read the first 20 pages and I, my brain was just like, ooh, ooh, I like, I like these sentences. And then I just got bored because you can't, for me, just be 200 pages of random philosophies that are sort of connected, but not really. This is a day in the life on a space station. It's international. So you have these, I think it's like six to seven people going through a day in their life and they're musing on things, but they're never, they never feel like characters and they don't even feel that distinct, which they should feel distinct. They're from different countries, <laughs> different genders, different lived experiences. I don't know. And there was like sort of this typhoon that was supposed to put everything together, I think. And I just, it was okay. I wish I had been able to keep that feeling I had in the beginning for the entire book because I was in those first 20 pages. I was like, ooh, I like these random anecdotes and thoughts, but you can't just be anecdotes for a whole book for me. That's just not, that's not who I am. The next one, and like we have a few here that are like really into grief. <laughs> Actually, a lot of these are really into grief. What does that say about the human condition? Just always processing loss. Um, we have the sift which is probably the lowest amount of ratings because this is like really small press. I did not mind this, but it definitely did a lot of literary fiction things that just don't always work for me. <laughs> um, like there will be sentences where I'm just like, wait, is she eating a rock or not? <laughs> like I just, I sometimes I need to be like very literally told what's happening. And if I'm supposed to be like in a dreamlike state or is it real? Like I need some sense of grounding. And I think our narrator was just a bit too unreliable for me. Um, this is like a travel story of these two women. And it's about leaving behind what is known in this new environment and trying to find a hopeful beginning somewhere else. Very Mad Max Fury Road, but without the chase scenes. <laughs> and it's only two women. And like I said, it's very like, I, some moments are really grounded and some are very not grounded to the point where like, I question the existence of the other passenger at times. But at the same time, like it wasn't a bad story. It was really short. I read it in an evening. Um, and I, I do like what it was trying to do. I just kept being jarred out of it because I couldn't figure out what is metaphor and what is real. And sometimes I just need to know the rules of the situation I'm reading. I need to know how, I don't know, how, how to suspend my disbelief. It just has to be self-consistent for whatever it is. It doesn't have to tell me the rules I just need to feel like there are rules, even if I don't know them, if that makes sense. And I know that just like seems weird, but there are some stories I read where I understand, oh, this is just allowed here. And that actually goes for the next one. And that's, it lasts forever and then it's over. This one's completely wonky, but it was like, it like jumped the shark, <laughs> lack of a better word, right from the get go. So I just was like, okay, laws of physics, not here. We're just not, we're not doing it. Um, and it but it was sort of self-consistent and I liked ex its exploration of grief more personally, 
This one, our main character is a zombie and she does not remember her past, but she does keep remembering this person she used to have a life with. And each part, um, you just kind of see them going through things and things get weird. Like there's a character who in theory dies, but then later on you see them again. And even the main character is like, what is happening? It just feels like a fever dream, but it's always a fever dream. So I have, you know, buy-in to the scenario. I understand its rules, you know, it's, it's plausibility made sense to me. And this one was really short. Um, it, it was not a very long time. I also thought the writing was pretty humorous at times. Like, I just think the actual prose style of this one was maybe my favorite, maybe my second favorite of all the lit fics. Because when you're reading literary fiction, a lot of why you're there is not because you're there to learn something new about the human condition. Like I said, most of these are about grief in some way or another. Even Orbitals had themes of grief in it. It's about how that author puts that grief into words in a way that like blends with your head. It's the same thing with like music and like breakup songs or love songs, right? We have like thousands, but it's about the one that resonates with you because of the execution. I feel like that's a lot about literary fiction. And so for me, It Lasts Forever and Then It's Over was a fantastic way of exploring loss and grief and moving on and, you know, acceptance and all that. I thought it was fantastically done. Um, my favorite in this section is The Skin and Its Girl. Uh, this is just... I mean, I say it's literary fiction because I guess a lot of people on the internet do. And it's definitely like not fantastical. Like there's like one fantastical element. This girl is born with blue skin and she's denser than the average human. That's it. The rest of it is very grounded in 21st century reality. So <laughs> I just didn't feel comfortable making this at all speculative. And like the writing is beautiful at times, but I don't think it's particularly challenging. It's a pretty straightforward narrative of this woman at this at a grave site because <laughs> grief of her aunt, who is a key component of her upbringing and a lot of the decisions made in her life. And she's at this gravesite being like, I don't know what to do next. Do I follow the person I love or do I stay with my family? And she recounts the part of her aunt's life that she was present for. And we also get flashbacks to other stories in her aunt's life. So it's a story of her aunt. Ironically, not the skin and its girl, the, skin, the girl with the blue skin is about her aunt and her living in her skin. And it's beautiful. Oh, I loved it. This is like, Oh, it's it's up there. This is one of my favorites that's on this list. And um, I learned a lot about Palestine in, I feel like, a less traumatic way than normal. Like, not that those traumatic stories aren't important. Um, but sometimes, you know, a place is more than its trauma. I'm like a big thing when it comes to that. It's like there's the heavy moments, but then there's also like the why we live moments. And that's a big presence here. Um, there are definitely scenes that will remind you that this is an occupied state and what that does to people and how that it hasn't always been this way. I think a lot of times when you're born after historical moments, you just assume the status quo has always been that way. Kind of like, you know, the credit score system in the United States. That's always been there, right? That's not something that's only like 40 to 50 years old, you know, like silly things like that. Um, so yeah, I just really loved the writing. I loved the family, these women, like, and that's also the highlight. Like there are important men in the story, but it's mostly about these women and they're spectacular. They're, they're very different. Um, there are trigger warnings in this story, especially around the main character's mother, who um, has big mental health problems that come with um, troubling suicidal ideation thoughts, things like that. So just know that, but I adored it. This was probably the one I wouldn't have even known to read. And I'm so happy I read it. Like if I had read this for my old book club back in Boston, I've just been like, yes, this is so good. So those are all my like literary fiction, how I felt about them generally you know, pretty good. I'm glad I was pushed out of my comfort zone for sure. Now we're in the SFF literary subcategory. Um, my least favorite of this, and like it's recency biased, maybe my least favorite book, unsure, but this is The Siege of Burning Grass. Now, like, I don't think this is poorly crafted, but I was just really bored and it was really long for how bored I was. Like, it's not like that long, but it was like 350 pages and I was just so bored. And I think part of that, you can argue thematically, what's the point of war? What's the point of this book? You know, but like, that doesn't make it fun. <laughs> I think there are interesting ways to discuss war and the effects of war that don't have to be so boring. But that said, I do think the atmosphere was very good. You definitely, felt the sense of resources and you felt the lack of just ability to keep going, but no one's going to quit and what's that's doing to the average person. I think where I was disappointed here is you introduce a really cool world as the backdrop for this fairly straightforward thought experiment of 
pacifism versus violence and ending a conflict, which is like an interesting concept to look into. And then you just like never really unpack the fantastic world we're in. Like I've seen books do this. Machineries of Empire does this. Another book on this list does this. So I think I was a little disappointed there because it's just like, well, if we're not going to do that, then can we just focus more on these characters or something? Like I just, I don't know, I felt disappointed in many aspects of this reading experience, which is a shame because I do think it's a story worth telling, but also it's a rebellion story. And I'm like a stupid hard sell on a rebellion story. It's just, that's just, that's just me. Uh, the next one is the one that's been making all of the award circles, and that's the Saint of Bright Doors. Um, this one was just very fine for me. There were moments of brilliance that I just loved reading this. The story of the main character's mother, fantastic. Um, the speculative element, so whimsical and just vibrant. Like <laughs> this world is well realized and you get to spend time in it and exploring it. And when it feels like a fever dream, it feels earned and you don't feel completely thrown out of it. Um, I sort of think I get the point of the story. So I think that gives it a little bit higher of Siege of Burning Grass. And I had more fun reading this, but it was a story that because of the writing style, I was always so drained after a reading session. Like the writing style was incredibly dense for my brain. Um, so like, even with audiobook help. If I was listening to the audiobook and I wasn't doing a task like dishes or something, I would s start to drift off and want a nap. That's just how the sentence structure and my brain didn't work. But in terms of following this character and him finding agency in his own life after being kind of like groomed for a specific role by his mother was I think really compelling. It's not that dissimilar to some of the th themes in The Skin and Its Girl in that way. <laughs> Although they're very different in terms of fantasy scope. And I also think this one you, will be enhanced for you if you know the source material it's retelling, which I did not, but I did love reading reviews afterwards about the source material. But I think for me, just how my brain works, even knowing the source material, the writing style was just never going to be a good blend for me and how I process the stories. And then the last one for this section is the Library of Unbroken Worlds or Broken Worlds. I cannot remember. This is the only young adult on this list. And it's a very challenging read, period, regardless of reading category, because this also has a very cool world. Like, whoa. And it's also like, it's about change in government, not necessarily about war or rebellion. It's about trying to prevent the start of a war because we have this, I guess, this weird God that demands sacrifice. And so there's going to be a war to allow for the sacrifice, but we're trying to prevent that from happening, essentially. And our main character is an AI, which I think is really cool. And this weird sci fantasy world, it's so cool. And you're just like slowly unpacking it through the lens of this coming of age story of this weird AI child and her relationship to the librarian and the role the librarian plays in trying to make sure this conflict doesn't happen and where they fail and where they succeed. I had some issues with the resolution, which is where I always have issues in a rebellion story, but I have to respect the scope that this was trying to do. Like it was so cool. It's love of storytelling. It's faith in how the revealing of truth can change things, which I don't necessarily believe in. I don't think when you tell people the truth, they change their mind. Um, I think when you tell people the truth and they see that the truth affects them, maybe. But here there's like definitely a lot of secrets of the past that get revealed, which is fun for you as the reader, I think, because that's just enjoyable. But if you like stuff like Nine Fox Gambit or Gideon the Ninth or just really fascinating sci fantasy things, you got to try this out and see if the writing style will work for you. I also love the narrative framework. We have this young girl talking to this god and that, that those are the interludes between each section. Um, that's how you get introduced to the next part of the story. And yeah, I just this one I think stuck with me longer than I anticipated. I haven't read it for like two months and I'm still like can really remember a lot of what went down here. And now we can get into these are genre. Like these are just standard sci-fi fantasy books. The first one is a novella, Mammoths at the Gate by Nevo. Nevo is always a favorite in the award circuits. I'm wondering, is this one here because it discusses grief? Who knows? There's a lot of grief talk <laughs> in these nominee lists because this one's directly a, a funeral um, for a character. And it's actually quite complex because when you join this monastery, you give up your past life. 
and this character has passed away and is very important to Chi, our, um, our cleric. But also when they come home, there are these mammoths at the gate and these are the family members of this person from their previous life. And there's potentially gonna be a conflict and there are stories that are revealed. It's just, it's nice. It's not for me. I feel like most of the Singing Hill Cycle books have not been for me since the first one, but a lot of people really like it. Um, like I said, for me, it was just okay. I thought there was a lot of um, stuff that I just didn't agree with. Like, I don't know. I think everyone processes grief differently. And I just think I can't relate to the way that some of these characters were to the point where I'm just like, this feels stupid and like you're overreaching. But again, that's just, I process things differently. So I can, I can understand that I just was being less sympathetic because I was annoyed by some character decisions. <laughs> but you know, it wasn't a bad story. If you want something that looks at grief and storytelling, I think it's good. The next two are pretty high up there for me. I really like them. So those be on the wall. This one, I'm so glad this is on the list because a lot of this awards list is about imagining a future and imagining not necessarily a bad future or anything like that, but like, you know, trying to imagine something different. And what Those Beyond the Wall does is it shows you Ashtown. So if you've read The Space Between Worlds, there is Ashtown and then there's the walled city. And it's basically haves and haves nots. And basically this area that of Ashtown was occupied by the walled city. They did not ask for that. And so we're with Ashtown with a character who's incredibly unlikable, who is flawed, who has committed crimes, but there's huge themes of rehabilitation and what that can look like, even for really heinous criminal acts. And I think it's interesting to have a world like that, where people who commit crimes and people who don't live together and the emphasis on community and community healing. Um, it doesn't always look pretty. And I really like the fact that it's not trying to make it look like some utopia. But I also like the idea that, you know, it's not pro prisons or anything like that. You know, I, I, I think that that's something that it does really well. I also really liked the ending, mainly because, and maybe this is the jaded part of me, most rebellion stories, I don't think their path would work. I don't know if this path that this book took would work, but it felt way more realistic to the scenarios I've seen in the real world. And that's also been like a criticism of this book is for some people, it felt too much like a conversation with our real world events. Uh, but in my head, I'm like, but that's the whole point of science fiction, right? Like it's about using our real world events and having a conversation and imagining different outcomes or different scenarios for them to play out in. Like there's a reason why Isaac Asimov books are so focused on nuclear power and the role it plays, um, because I don't know if you knew this, but in the 1950s, we were really into nuclear power. <laughs> like sci-fi is always having a conversation with the time period it's being written in. And I think this is a great piece to add into the canon about the different types of resistance and the different types of rehabilitation and communities that exist even when people are in occupied spaces. And also just how those communities are viewed differently from different angles. I really liked it. So yeah, um, this one was a big strong success for me. And then probably similar to The Skin and Its Girl, the one that I was most excited that I read because of this project, because I had already read those Beyond the Wall. I read that because I love Micaiah Johnson. So like this wasn't read for this award. I was just excited it was put on it. This was read because of the award and I was so surprised at how much I loved it. And this is Some Desperate Glory, which I think has won the Hugo, which is also exciting to me. Um, Some Desperate Glory is really fun. Um, I mean, it has some dark material. We definitely have a lot of deconstruction of a very harmful government and the views that they put on their children and how that plays off. But woo, it's an engaging time. It has that really great blend of entertaining science fiction, military sci-fi read with thematic discussion. I thought it did that both, it did it so well through the character work of, um, oh, Valkyr. Valkyr's character development in this is phenomenal. It is so good. <laughs> um, and I really like how the ending played out. Yeah, this is another one where again, we're trying to institute change and that's hard <laughs> and how we get to the change here felt earned and i was really entertained along the way i really liked exploring this world i thought that was really fun because it has a lot of aliens like this is a sci-fi book with aliens um so yeah i don't know what my favorite is if i really had to pick a favorite of all of these <sighs> in my wheelhouse in genre i think it's some desperate glory and then outside my wheelhouse is the skin and its girl so 
For me, Project is relatively a success. There are some I probably should have DNF'd, but I'm stubborn sometimes and I like to finish a project. Have you read any of these? Are there any of these you want to pick up after hearing about them? What's your favorite award? I think this award, I find my most like hidden gems or I get the most surprises. So I enjoy reading the shortlist. So I'll probably keep doing it for the next couple years until I get bored. Um, and if you just want to leave an emoji to let me know you're here. Oh, leave a space emoji for some desperate glory, like a spaceship or a planet. That's great with me. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.